hopefully the people on Zoom can see and hear everything, but somebody uh, sing, send a signal if you can't. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, it's good to see everybody this afternoon. Uh, this, uh, this lecture has been a long time coming. This was originally planned uh, in April, and then the uh, pandemic happened. So obviously, it's been put off a little bit. So. Uh, it's somewhat hard to believe that this day is finally here, but, uh, but it's good to see everybody. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, W. Kendall McNabney uh, Endowed Lectureship for 2021. I'm Adam Algren, for those of you that I don't know, which I think I know most everybody here. Uh, I'm currently the chair of the uh, Department of Emergency Medicine. So I just wanted to start off by you know, acknowledging the recent passing of uh, Dr. McNabney. He was obviously an icon within uh, the organization, the specialty of emergency medicine and uh, the community. And, uh, he, you know, he impacted thousands of individuals, learners, patients uh, in his career. And, you know, I think we're all thankful for what he was able to teach us about being a skilled, compassionate physician and, and a good human being. And so he'll be deeply missed, and, uh, but we know that his memory and his legacy will live on within the department and the organization. So this is, uh, you know, currently where we're at, uh, which is Truman Medical Center, uh, a la University Health as of October 1st. So obviously we're, we're fortunate to uh, work in a... Uh, uh, modern physical plants, but uh, certainly the beginnings uh, in, in what Dr. McNabney did uh, start back at the old General Hospital, which uh, I've kept in some of the quotes from, from previous presentations, uh, but uh, uh, these, uh, this one reads that uh, it may not be the classiest act in town, but the emergency room is a tough act to follow. So I guess that's positive, huh? And <laughs> uh, that... Uh, it boasts few uh, conveniences, but uh, at least there's two doctors on duty at any time. And I, I would like to think that at least we have a few conveniences now, and, and we still have at least two doctors, so that's, that's good. Uh, clearly, we've come a long way from this, and uh, you know, we don't have uh, patients right on top of each other anymore for the most part, but... Uh, you know, for, for as far as we've come, some things still stay the same. You know, for people in the inner city where their family doctor said, uh, Dr. McNabney, they come here at three or four o'clock in the morning for a cold. So as much as things change, they stay the same sometimes. So here's a, a picture of Dr. McNabney uh, working hard answering the uh, ambulance biocom. Uh, you know, clearly it's, uh, you know, technology's changed a little bit, you know. That thing's the, the size of a small house. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Dr. McNabney really helped pioneer emergency medicine uh, in the country and uh, really uh, kind of set, laid the groundwork for the formation of the specialty in our country. He was the chair of emergency medicine here from 1972 to 1986. He founded our residency program in 1973, which was one of the uh, earliest programs in the country. He served as president of the University Association of EMS, which is now SAEM, and he also served on the board of directors of ABIM. So I think there's a couple quotes I'd like to share that, that really embody what Dr. McNamney uh, did. And I know this one has been uh, used before, but I, I thought it did such a good job of summarizing, uh, summarizing his impact. So when the, when the effective leader is finished with his work, the people say it happened naturally. And the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. And, and I think Dr. McNabney did a great job of inspiring us all to, to, to want to be better physicians and, and to do better. So here's, here's a picture of uh, Dr. McNabney uh, working hard and inspiring. And uh, these are just some of the, uh, or I guess these are all of the classes of, of prior emergency medicine residents that have uh, been through the program. So uh, pay attention. You may see some of your faces on here. 
I'd just like to highlight the, uh, the fine speaker that we have today it was uh, present in one of these. Yeah, I, 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 I've always wondered what happened with that class. All right, and as much as Dr. McNabney, you know, worked hard, he, he could play hard too and ha had a lot of things that he enjoyed doing outside of work, including fishing. And so, uh, you know, I think that is a good segue into uh, our speaker. And so it's uh, my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Robert Muehlman, who is uh, currently a professor emeritus of emergency medicine at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Muehlman earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Nebraska in 1979. He followed that with his doctorate of medicine at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. Following medical school, he subsequently completed his residency in emergency medicine at UMKC and Truman Medical Center and followed that with a research fellowship here as well. After completing his fellowship, uh, Dr. Muehlman stayed on uh, as faculty here at uh, uh, UMKC and Truman, and he served as the research director and uh, rose to the rank of associate professor at, at UMKC and, and Truman. In 1998, he left uh, Truman to become the chief of the section of emergency medicine at the University of Nebraska, and then he uh, became professor in 2000. And I think it's safe to say that Dr. Muehlman did an incredible amount of work uh, at, at Nebraska uh, to really grow emergency medicine there, and, and he did a phenomenal job of establishing what is now a, a tremendous department of emergency medicine. Uh, and so he became the founding chair of that department in 2007. And currently, uh, they have over 40 emergency medicine faculty. They have a residency that has uh, 36 residents total. They have three fellowships and they're in the top 20 of all departments of emergency medicine for NIH funding. So uh, uh, Bob stepped down as chair in 2016 and, and has continued to work. And uh, last year uh, backed off a little further and is working part-time and, and hence that's why he is now a uh, professor emeritus. So in addition to being an emergency physician, uh, Bob is, is an educator and researcher and uh, he's been awarded numerous grants and has over 70 peer-reviewed publications, mostly in the area of injury and, and violence prevention. Uh, he's also uh, served in multiple leadership roles at the local, state, and national levels, including uh, being the chair of the RRC of Emergency Medicine, as well as on the board of directors and president of the American Board of Emergency Medicine. So being from Nebraska, you know, Nebraskans tend to be proud about their football team, uh, although I don't want to tell Bob what kind of season they're having this year. So uh, we, we already discussed this a little bit uh, prior to the talk. And then in, in doing some research for, uh, for this presentation, I came across uh, that Nebraska is, is home of uh, the first Arbor Day in the country, which, which I found amusing given based on this slide, it looks like they have a little bit of work left to do with the whole tree planting thing. So, uh, you know, I've known Bob for a few years and, and I've learned that he is very much a wine enthusiast. Uh, you can see I was able to scour the uh, interweb and find uh, uh, this photo from a couple decades ago of, of him eagerly awaiting his next pour at, at wine school. <laughs> and then uh, I, I vividly remember our last conversation that we had about you educating me on the nuances of the Norton grape. Uh, and so I, I will never forget that. And then here's uh, Bob and his wife, Diane, uh, with some of the harvest from one of the vineyards that they own. So, and with that, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Robert Muehlman. So please join me in welcoming. All right, I think you should be all good to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, we do have the best three and four football team in the country, <laughs> by the way. So. <laughs> Just wanna, I just want to get that in there. 
Uh, I can't tell you how honored I am here to give the McNamney Lectureship. You know, I was just thinking as, as this day was coming around that it was 38 years ago this month that I first met Dr. McNamney when we used to do interviews in person for residencies. Yeah. <laughs> I remember driving down to Kansas City, and that was before, you know, you could uh, do a lot of internet searching. So I found a little hotel on uh, Troost. <laughs> I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. <laughs> But meeting Dr. McNamney, I just remembered how humble and kind he was, and we didn't talk one thing about medicine. And another one of his hobbies was the Oregon Trail, and of course the Oregon Trail goes right through Nebraska where all those trees are. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and I was just so impressed because so many people in medicine are so full of themselves, and that's when I knew that I'd feel very comfortable coming to Truman, and I'm glad I did and got to know him even more. Uh, when Dr. Gratton asked me a couple years ago, actually, to, uh, to, because it was canceled last year and the year before both because of COVID, uh, I was excited because I had asked Dr. McNamney about five years ago when UNO did a um, symposium on the 50 years of Vietnam, and they asked me to lead a panel on, uh, you know, how war met. If I grant every now and then, I've got a little spasm, so just so <laughs> excited about the talk, but. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, oh, how military medicine impacted civilian medicine after Vietnam, and I thought, who better to have come up and be a part of that panel than Dr. McNamney, who my understanding was the only trauma, or a mass, mass surgeon who came back and got involved in emergency medicine. Of course, that's a whole different talk on how that impacted emergency medicine. But, but I was impressed, you know, this guy in his 80s driving up to Omaha and, you know, being part of that. And just, we had a great time. And uh, so this is kind of payback for uh, uh, Dr. McNamney's uh, coming up and talking up in Nebraska. So when I asked Dr. Gratton, uh, you know, which I talk about, he said, well, Dr. McNamney always said uh, something that residents would be interested in. So I thought about the seven causes of hypocalcemia. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew you guys already knew that. So I chose a different topic. And then, of course, I am challenged here. Is it the forward button or? Oh, I guess it helps if I would turn it on. All right, now we're good to go. All right, so I chose burnout. Um, so uh, I think, of course, that's a hot topic, and it's even gotten hotter uh, with COVID, and I think, and uh, of course, I haven't incorporated any the COVID stuff. I think the story is still to be told on that impact. But, um, you know, as I was reading, when things would come out of about burnout, you know, some of it was believable, but some of it was unbelievable, particularly when they talked about prevalence of burnout, and um, so I dove in, and I'll tell you what, it's a black hole. I, I got very deep into this and then kind of tried to pull together what I could, so this will probably take the full hour, but um, let's go ahead and get started. So the green button turned off. <laughs> I wonder if it's a battery. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, I can use the keyboard, maybe. Yeah, or the mouse. The mouse will advance, too. Just, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Wait. There we go. So um, kind of narrowing it down, but this is going to be kind of a wide-ranging discussion here. We're going to try to clarify some of the terms of burnout, which I think is part of the problem is do we have all a common understanding of burnout? And we're going to look at the literature, looking at the prevalence literature just a little bit. And then we're going to look at burnout in emergency medicine. And then try to get uh, this concept of burnout as a spectrum, which makes a lot of sense to me. Not you're burned out or you're not burned out. And then um, kind of shows a couple of areas of resilience that I haven't heard much about. That I, The more I looked into it, the more I thought uh, uh, are good um, resilient strategies. So first of all, uh, burnout. Uh, what is the definition? Well, the ICD-11 says it's not a medical condition, it's an occupational phenomenon, um, and it results from chronic workplace stress, 
that has not been successfully managed. We understand that part. And then also it brings up the idea of um, energy depletion or exhaustion, um, mental di distance or cynicism, and uh, re reduced per professional productivity. Um, so, it, but they emphasize it's really um, occupational, it's in the occupational context and not applied to describe uh, experiences out, uh, out other areas of life, which to me, um, I think other areas of life are important both in causing and as well as resilience, but that's the definition. The uh, HRQ has one more focus on physicians. So that was a general definition, any industry or whatever, you can have burnout from occupational stress in terms of physicians. Then um, it's uh, characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and uh, decreased personal accomplishment. So it pulls in those same three ideas. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about moral injury because I, that's what I saw kind of creeping up in the literature and there's some confusion I think between moral injury and burnout. So I wanted to address that briefly, although I won't be talking a lot about moral injury. Uh, it was first described in, from Vietnam vets. Uh, they had symptoms similar but different than PTSD. So PTSD was um, uh, when, you, when there's threat to mortality whereas uh, moral injury was threat to morality. In other words, go do this act that's against your morals, and even though they survived and whatnot, they had that feeling. Well, in physicians, in the literature, it's things that prevent us from our moral duty, which is to put patients first. So in healthcare, it can be rules-driven healthcare practices from distant top-down administration. Dr. Steele, Dr. Grattan, <laughs> talking to you now. <laughs> Oh, the EMRs, you know, when they first rolled out, what a bunch of stress there. And um, also the productivity satisfaction measures. And this is where I think COVID fits in a little bit, but I think it could fit into PTSD, not so much emergency medicine. I, when you see the ICU nurses talking about dealing with death every day, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some PTSD. And there are some PTSD studies going on in emergency providers. So we might see more of that, but certainly the moral injury, especially... Uh, initially, when you know you get so many patients that the inpatient would fill up, now you're boarding patients, and now you can't take care of the patients in the waiting room. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a moral injury issue. And um, and now certainly when unvaccinated people come in, it's like you kind of hate those patients, and um, even though you need to take care of them. So uh, we won't talk much about moral injury, but moral injury contributes to distress, but it's not burnout. Um, so. Let's talk a little bit about burnout then. So again, the three areas are emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a low sense of personal accomplishment. Those are all the factors that go into that. And it appears to be common. You may be familiar with the Shannon Felt um, article that came out in 19 um, that shows all the specialties. Uh, the mean burnout report there was about 44% here. And it measured three years, so the bottom line is, I think, uh, 2011 and uh, 2014 and then 2017. And sure enough, emergency medicine's right at the top, so you've probably heard that ER's the you know, top burnout specialty. So that's not, that's not a good sign there. Also, burnout has serious consequences, not only to the individual with substance abuse, depression, poor self-care, motor vehicle crashes, uh, but also patient care and health in the health system. So, but a lot of these um, studies then are, you know, if you look at a, a um, outcome and then you, you measure burnout, these aren't causation studies. So um, anyway, that's where, you know, if this would be a typical burnout lecture, then we would show all the scary articles about how common it is. And then we talk about self-care and yoga and stuff like that. <laughs> how to address burnout, but I'm gonna take a little different tack here. So to evaluate the literature, we have to understand the measurement tool, and the most common measure, measurement tool is the Maslow Burnout Inventory. Uh, that first came out in the 80s, and, um, and they, they have different, um, for different um, occupations, so the health services survey is the one that physicians would fit under. Has anybody taken this survey? I, it's hard, I think. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's a 22-item survey that measures feelings of burnout among individuals working in the health services, like physicians. 
So there's nine items for emotional exhaustion, five for depersonalization, and eight for personal accomplishment. And the way they measure it is um, uh, you have to remember, did it happen like once this month that I feel that way, or was it a few times this month, or you know, once a week? I, I thought that was very difficult, particularly for emergency medicine. In other words, did I work a bunch of night shifts this month? Then I might feel different than you know if I took a, my week of vacation that month. So I think particularly for our specialty, this is a difficult survey. But regardless, if um, I'm going to, I didn't go to this one here. They would uh, look at the nine items in emotional ex uh, emotional exhaustion, and if you had a score of 27, which works out to a few times a month, then you'd be called, you know, burned out. Um, it's depersonalization uh, times five, the highest 10. So if once a month you felt like cynical, the other 29 days you were okay, <laughs> you're burned out. So, And personal accomplishment was the opposite. So a high score is a good one, a low score is a bad one. And if, if once a week you didn't feel good about yourself, then that was worked against you too. But my point is this, is that when you hear burnout, they're using measures that say somebody answered that question either once a month for depersonalization or more, or um, a few times a month or more. Uh, and because it's kind of difficult to administer, if you want to do a say on burnout, wouldn't it be great to have a two-question survey because then you can really survey a lot of people. They might answer two questions more likely than 22 questions. <laughs> And so the two questions are, I feel, and this was, uh, Wes did this in 2012, so there's been a lot of studies when you b read burnout, look to see if they're doing the two question or the 22 question survey. But this one, um, the question is, I feel burned out from my work. And if you feel that way a couple times a month, then you're burned out. Uh, even though the other 28, you felt pretty good. And depersonalization, again, once a month, and otherwise you feel pretty good. But it was interesting, when the article came out, they said these two questions shouldn't be reviews, re, uh, viewed as a replacement for the full uh, MASH, MASLAC burnout inventory, but you know, most people take it as gospel that, that, that it's an accurate tool. And also, it's not meant to be a, provide comprehensive assessment uh, of burnout for individuals. So again, most people, I think, don't understand the warnings of the two-question survey and the results that come from that. So rather than look, present all 182 studies on burnout, <laughs> physician burnout, I went to the JAM article from 2018 that did look at these closely. And um, so again, 182 studies, over 100,000 individuals, 45 countries over, uh, looks like about 30 years almost. So 86% 80, use the MM, MBI or um, um, modified version of that. So that's why I'd say it's the most common tool. But there's also other tools out there um, uh, but there's 142 definitions, and the overall burnout prevalence range from zero to 80 percent. That seems like a wide range to me. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly, you know, depending on the study you're looking at. But and they thought so too. So they looked at the 45 of the larger studies, which was only 300 participants or more. And again, they there was uh, different cutoffs used. And, um, and for the different subscales. And in the subscales, it narrowed the range a little bit, but you're still looking at, um, you know, single digits to, you know, 50, 60, 70% um, of burnout scores there. So again, the literature is all over the place on this. Um, Help. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. I pushed a little harder. All right, so that was the review of those. So, But I do want to look closely at a couple articles, going back to the Shanfeld article that looked at um, change over time. Um, so that, again, it was to evaluate uh, prevalence of burnout among all physicians, um, uh, comparing three, you know, two of 2011, 2014, 2017. 
uh, over 30,000 were invited to participate, but they had a 17% response rate. So I don't know, when you do survey literature, you kind of want it to be a little bit higher than that. But, and they used the two item survey. Again, I feel burned out from my work. If, if somebody answered it a few times a month, they were considered high risk. Uh, and uh, for the total group, 39% said this. And the depersonalizations, I become callous toward people since I took this job. If that's happened once a month or more, 27% at risk. And they, come, they said or. The Maslach survey is and, but they used or. So or is 44%. And that's where emergency, I didn't break down the two subgroups for emergency medicine, but the, and, uh, the, the, the two statements or, emergency medicine was the number one at 55%, a little bit lower than 2014, but still the highest among all specialties. What about resident burnout? Uh, this was published in, I've got a little thing here, 2019 also, I believe. Uh, you, you click on the green bar, you can move that up if you want. Yeah, I think I do. Just, I'm going to move it way down here. Down. Yeah, maybe I'll move it up. Anyway. All right. Anybody seen this study? I didn't see this one. It's kind of a scary study. Um, so... Anyway, they offered a $5 gift certificate. That got the response rate up to 21%, so that was good. <laughs> so a lot of uh, EM residents responded. I don't know if, but they used the full 21-item survey, which, again, limits response because it's kind of difficult to, or not difficult, it just takes a while. And, um, again, they used the, uh, def the common definitions of burnout in terms of cutoff scales. And <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I can do that. There we go. Oh my gosh. So uh, again, this is uh, all ER classes, first year, second year, third or third or fourth year classes. There's always an AV nerd here, so thank you for telling me that. So uh, the, the number that, emo uh, that li listed high emotional exhaustion, high depersonalization, or low personal accomplishment was up at 80%. And, you know, I think res I was, I think, burned out a few days a month during my residency. <laughs> but 80%, I don't know. I was going to have people put their heads down and raise their hand if they're burned out, but maybe it is 80%. Um, that'd be about as scientific as these, I think, but... Um, all right, here we go. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about problems with these studies, I think, if you're using the MBI, um, HHS. You know, when they design, when they measured those cutoffs, they weren't, uh, they didn't use, they weren't based on clinical criteria. In other words, uh, they administered this to a group of people, and they took the top third, and that was 27. They didn't say, you're burned out, what's your score? You're burned out, what's your score? You know, based on clinical criteria, you're burned out. And set a cutoff on people with burnout or above this score. They just divide it in thirds, the top third, middle third, lower third. So there's a, there, that cutoff score is just arbitrary. And really, when they designed it, it wasn't saying over 27, you're burned out. They said this is the top third of our, of our, of our group, that the normative data that we're using. And it was designed as a research tool, not a diagnostic one. And because so many studies were using it as a diagnostic indicator in 2016, when they, it's a proprietary tool, so you have to like buy it if you're going to use it. The manual uh, removed the cutoff scores because they didn't have any diagnostic value, and they saw that all the literature was using it to diagnose burnout uh, in groups of people. So I think we're going to see an easing up of that or a more careful use of the language uh, in terms of burnout or burnout symptoms, and we'll see some of that in some of the literature here, I think. Um, this one's a little... Uh, and then the, I, I alluded to the fact that originally it was this and emotional exhaustion and depersonalization and low personal accomplishment but a lot of studies are coming out as ORs in, in terms of their prevalence number. The other thing with the two-question surveys, I feel burned out from my work. 
Um, it's a self-definition, right? Uh, and so um, without defining components of burnout, it violates a sure definition of burnout. And that's why if I had to put your head down and say, are you burned out? I don't know, I mean, what's your definition of burnout? What's my definition of burnout? So, and also clinical, if you're clinic, the clinical burnout person, it's not a transitory state. It doesn't happen once or twice a month. It's, you're burned out. It's every day. Um, and so that's another problem with these cutoffs is that um, it's, it doesn't really, I don't think, point out clinical burnout. And the other thing is that in these studies it says, you know, even if it's 55% of ER physicians are burned out, does that mean 45% are well? I don't know which is, I, I don't believe either one of those because I don't think we're all well here. And I'll get into that a little bit on the spectrum. <laughs> But I also don't think there, half of us are burned out, clinically burned out, as, as, as it's appropriately defined. Uh, yeah, this, this alludes to a little bit to the causation studies saying that, you know, burned out physicians make more medical errors. If, when you look closely at that, you know, at first you've got to identify who's burned out, and then how do you measure safety? It's very difficult. And not, not to say that that's not uh, a real deal, it's just uh, I haven't really seen convincing evidence in the literature in terms of how big of a problem it causes other, you know, the health system and uh, clinical care. And then I mentioned also, I think uh, ER, EM uh, studies are unique, um, especially on these surveys that talk about once or twice a month um, and how we respond to those because of our varying shifts and how exhausted we feel much of the time. So this has a little bit of a trigger to it. What are we measuring? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. When I read, I, I don't know what they're measuring. There's numerous definitions of burnout. There's numerous measurement tools with different cutoffs. It's uh, MBI is not being used as it was designed to be used. You can't measure burnout accurately. How can you measure its consequences? So, I think in the future, burnout literature. Um, there needs to be uh, language that accurately reflects our experience. So again, this deal of moral injury versus burnout versus, you know, whatever else you might want to call it. I don't think we have that common language. And the it's consistent terminology refers to the same condition or symptoms. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that's where we need to go with burnout literature. So as emergency medicine has been... <laughs> So here's some crispy critters right here. <laughs> uh, this was the summer of 1998, back in the day, right? I think this was in your driveway, Mark, or by your garage somewhere. I think it was a summer party. I recognize the color. Yeah. So I can vouch every one of these guys has been burned out at least one day a month in their career, every single one of them. But, um, uh, <laughs> but also they know I'd have a good time, so I just thought I'd throw in an old picture there. <laughs> All right. Is, it, is emergency medicine as bad as reported? So I think there's some hope, in, I think, in some of the studies I've seen. Um, this was a study looking at um, burnout. And again, this one is burnout symptoms, so I like this one. I didn't say that these people are burned out. It's like, are you... You know, we've got these cutoff scores. We're going to call it symptoms. I don't know if they're burned out or not, but emergency medicine uh, in this study was the third highest risk of burnout symptoms. So we knew that. We knew that if you ask these questions, we're going to rate high on them. But it was the third lowest rate of career regret, meaning that I wish I wouldn't have become a doctor. And it was the second lowest in specialty choice. So you're dealing with a bunch of you know, exhausted doctors who love what they do, I think is what it boils down to. And I found that encouraging. So again, going back to the um, resident wellness survey, when you appropriately use and, and, and for the three measures, you know, you're down in the 10 to 20% range, which I don't know, I, is Adam, your current chair, I, I always found about one in eight physicians were in distress of some sort, like many crises, maybe one in ten. But but so this to me is somewhat believable um, in terms of, uh, in this case, residents that are having issues, and you need to recognize it and address it. It's not eighty percent, but um, but 
you know, too high, but not as high as I think people are reporting. Uh, you know, so also, so what about you get through your rent, the you know, excitement's over and you're out and doing your job day in and day out. If you were, if we were burning people out at great scales, you'd see a lot of attrition. And I haven't seen evidence of high attrition rates. Um, this is the EM board certification <coughs> attrition rate. <clears throat> Runs under 2%. This is a little artificial, of course, because that's people that don't renew their board. So you might have recertified back in the tenure recertification, you might have recertified and then uh, retired two years later and then forgot to tell the boards that, you, you know, you're not practicing anymore. And so then uh, when your recertification comes up, you don't recertify, okay, now you're part of that 2%. So there'll be some catching up to do on that. But I think that's artificially low, but we don't, you don't see as, and among all specialties that measure it the same way, it's lower than almost every other specialty. So you're not seeing physicians um, leave at a great scales. I thought a better attrition uh, <laughs> is this one. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that next slide. <laughs> this thing's got a, like a trigger finger. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> now I gotta go back. <laughs> okay. All right, so. Uh, did anybody read the workforce study article uh, that came out saying that there's going to be 10,000 more jobs? You guys read that one? Yeah, I think most residents have read that one. So on the committee, when we were looking, you know, there's several things that go into that formula, and one of them was attrition. And um, so part of that, we had somebody look at um, uh, attrition among practicing physicians, and this looked at uh, Medicare billing rates. Um, so this cohort uh, that build the EM level codes, so that's how they got the number, and then followed that cohort over several years, and the next year they did the same thing. And what it looked like was um, it was about 4% a year. So all things being equal, um, and of course not, there's not the same number of physicians the same age. It's more of a younger specialty still, but that's starting to flatten out. 4% would mean, on average, a 25-year career, right? So if a cohort practices 25 years, that you drop out on your 26th year, that'd be your 4% attrition rate. And it doesn't happen that way, but that's um, believable, knowing that some people change right away. Some people go part-time at some point. This didn't measure part-time. Um, but I think 4% is right. The reason I bring up the workforce study is that as a group, we were trying to say, was it 2%, is it 4%, and they settled on 3% based on no data, <laughs> but of all the factors that went into that study, attrition rate had the most, so it wasn't how many residencies there were, how many residents coming out, how many patients the mid-level saw, which all factored in a little bit. If you change those, it would change it a little bit. If you change it from 3% to 4%, that would be 5,000 more jobs, so instead of 9,000 oversupply, it'd be 4,000 oversupply. So, I just, we're not talking about workforce here, but um, that's where this data came from. So again, the point is, is that we're not seeing ER docs dropping out of the specialty in droves. Maybe going part-time, maybe, you know, supplementing other things, but they're not leaving in droves. All right, this is a busy slide here, but this um, is sort of like the, the residency one in a way because um, the Shanafelt study also looked at um, work-life integration. So this is... Uh, burnout. He didn't. He 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 didn't say burnout symptoms. He said burned out. ER number one. But in work life integration, ER was number two, best specialty for that. So the yellow lines. It doesn't really matter. Just showing there's a lot of specialties that you know would measure high in burnout, but also high in work life integration. Emergency medicine's one of them. Um, I mean, it's not like. Uh, pediatrics or radiation oncology, orthopedic surgery, ophthalmology, ENT, psychiatry, which have low burnout symptoms but also high work-life integration. But it's not as bad as, you know, these <laughs> other ones, OBGYN, where they're tired and they don't have good integration. Anyway, so, you know, uh, I think we've got issues in terms of exhaustion and things like that, but also we also have a lot of opportunities for resilience and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So we're good. 
Or are we? <laughs> Here's some resilience. So I was trying to remember the year, but this was, remember when um, Steve Hardgarten gave the McNamney lectureship, and so he was the chair up in Milwaukee, and uh, I had done a, some motorcycle injury studies with him, and so he gave me the Harley Davidson t-shirt. I didn't, I didn't own one. I had a Honda 550, but yeah. Yeah, it's not quite a Harley. But. <laughs> So you might think I drink more than Mark, but this was my first beer, and this was Mark's third beer. So <laughs> we had different resiliency strategies back then. So <laughs> thought you'd appreciate. So don't get me wrong; I'm not saying burnout's not a problem. Uh, I'm just saying there's a problem with burnout literature. Uh, burnout would, I think, classifies as a wicked problem, which is a technical term. Uh, wicked problems. <laughs> And the technical term is, is that it's a problem that's hard to define and that it has no easy, easy or reproducible or attainable solution. So there's a lot of wicked problems in the world, but we're going to talk about burnout as a wicked problem. And since there are no uh, solutions, there's only better or worse strategies. So either you find ways to decrease uh, distress or stress at home or work. And again, we're leaving the definition a little bit. We're bringing in home stress. Um, because the people, you know, physicians that are in distress, they're doing the same job as everybody else. I mean, what's going on? I mean, it's, they're exposed to the same concentration camp that everybody else is. But uh, often it's things at home that are going on. And uh, again, there's uh, the, the other strategy is to increase uh, resilience. So why are physicians at risk of burnout? Uh, four main causes. I remember early on, I think it was as a resident, Dr. McNamney said, and he, he might have been turning his head this way, he just said, Doctor, doctoring is hard work. Did you ever hear him say that? He, I, I've heard him say it more than once. Doctoring is hard work, and at the time I thought, well, it's better than digging ditches, that's not that bad. And, <laughs> but as time goes on, it's like, you're right, this is hard work, doctoring is hard, it's hard to get up in the morning sometimes, it's hard work. But that's, you know, if anybody's going into medicine, I don't discourage them, but I tell them it's hard work. <laughs> you better, I want you to complain about how hard it is, because it's hard. Uh, then the non-clinical aspects of our job, and I think that's changed quite a bit over time, too. And again, um, you know, whether it's the administrators telling us what to do or <laughs> other things, it just seems to be more things slowing you down from just taking care of people. Probably for good reason, but I, I haven't figured out what that is yet. <laughs> And then life outside can be stressful too, and that's just the reality. And then our medical education survival skills aren't the best in terms of mitigating burnout because we tend to be workaholics, a superhero, emotion-free, perfectionists. I mean, it got us through our training, but it's not necessarily serving us well now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about stress and exhaustion and fatigue and things like that. So you're probably familiar with this curve. It has to do with performance and stress. And so people that want stress-free lives are going to be, um, you know, probably low performance some, in some ways. Um, so you, you want to get to that point of fatigue if you're going to perform well. Now, whether that's training for the marathon or, you know, whatever else you're doing that you want to be good at. But if you want to be a good physician, the training is, I think, to get to fatigue because it's a fatiguing job. And if you don't get to that point, how are you going to learn how to mitigate that? On the RRC, you know, when we looked at the duty uh, work hours task force, and it changed from just workforce, but one of the results of that, I mean duty hours, one of the results of that was requiring uh, programs to do fatigue mitigation. And I think that was uh, not named very well, because I think we want to work to fatigue. It should have been exhaustion mitigation. Because you don't want to go to, just like when you train, you don't want to train to exhaustion. Otherwise, it's counterproductive. Same thing, I think, in medical training or medical care. You don't want to be exhausted. But fatigue, I think, is OK. And again, understanding that your performance increases as your um, stress level goes up. So stress can be good, but it can also be bad if you go too far that way. And. Um, Burnout is a spectrum, not a dyad. I won't spend too much time on this other than to say this particular study uh, looked at several burnout studies and outcomes and, um, and really um, thought burnout was, uh, the underpinning of that was conservation of resource theory, which 
uh, is kind of, I think, I'm not a sociologist, psychologist, but what it mentions is that um, physicians strive to maintain or increase their resources and are averse to loss. So our job resources, of course, our time with our patients, positive relationship with the team. I think that's gotten me through a lot of stuff is that you like who you're working for, which is another COVID deal because everybody's quitting, which I think is a loss of resources, uh, working equipment, et cetera, moral, so um, other types of moral injury. And then um, your emotional resources, your ability to adapt and, and um, adjust, which is resilient. So burnout occurs then when you lose resources or demands more than you have. And it's a dynamic spiral of loss and not just a, either you are or you aren't. But emotional exhaustion is the gateway to that. And so this, um, mm -mm -mm. this is a busy slide, but I think it shows a little bit about the cascade or spiral of loss. Now, I spent most of my career here, and I've dipped below here once or twice. And so again, the, uh, just briefly go over these stages. So hyperactivity, extra effort, achieving goals, working more, um, but it takes away from loved ones for work sometimes. So that, and then that, of course, that always leads to exhaustion, chronic fatigue, um, then your performance less effective. Um, you might still have good patient interactions, but it takes area from other resources, so maybe you're isolating more because it's too hard to decide if you want beans or peas for dinner. It's like, that's too many decisions for me right now. I'm, I'm done making decisions today. And then, uh, of course, withdrawal, resignation, reduced empathy. Uh, we've all been there, I think. But the, you can recover from this. And, um, uh, uh, and I think a lot of the resiliency strategies, you know, the mind-body stuff works well in this area. Uh, but then if you continue, of course, aggression, negative cynicism. I remember as a resident one time when I was down in the cafeteria and I think I was getting red beans and rice and they didn't give me enough beans or something. I don't remember, but I was, in my mind, I was like really angry at this cafeteria worker. And that was a signal to me that something's the matter here. Why would I be mad at a cafeteria worker? When, but I was very stressed at the time. But anyway, so, you know, you get down into this area and, I, and like I said, I think I've dipped into this area. But then there's the breakdown, degradation, and certainly down here you need professional help. Here I think you need different um, uh, mitigation strategies, and that's what I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. So again, it's not an either or. It's we're all on that spectrum, and that's what I mean. We're all a little bit ill. You just have to find where you're at on that spectrum because you'll find yourself there somewhere. So was, that was interesting. Maslach then, and back in '16, about the time he said, "Don't use this for diagnosis." Um, uh, commented that uh, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, of course, are linked together. But depersonalization is an even, even bigger contributor to the overall idea or construct of burnout than emotional exhaustion. But what are all the studies? Most of them are, have to do with focusing on emotional exhaustion is a primary definition of burnout. And um, again, that's a phase you go through. They're linked together. It's the gateway. Uh, it's the depersonalization that um, really is when you start to, I think, get close to what we think of as burnout. So we're going to change gears here again and talk about coping strategies. I thought this was interesting, not so much on the strategies, which I thought were somewhat limited, but it did it by um, generations. So I think I'm a boomer. Uh, <laughs> So how do I co how does my peers cope? Well, we isolate. I can relate to that. Exercise, talk with friends, sleep is the least common strategy here of the four. But what about millennials? They sleep more <laughs> and they exercise less. So I I don't I forget what years millennials start and end. But you guys need to get up and uh, start to exercise. Wake up. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and I thought that was kind of, um, anyway, that was the 2020 burnout and suicide report. Um, so, but I think there's more tools in the toolbox there. Um, and, and certainly isolating is, is that a symptom of burnout or is it you're trying to conserve resources or is it a strategy? I'm not sure. But so we talk about resilience all the time. What is it? Well, it's a capacity to prepare for, recover, adapt in the face of distress or adversity. 
and it can vary over time. You know, some shifts I go in and it's like, bring it on, and other shifts are like, oh, I don't know if I can do this today. What if something bad happens? So, you know, day in day, you can have different resilience. But um, the concept here is it really involves four domains, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And again, most of the things on burnout talk about uh, mind-body, which is important. So this table kind of goes over that a little bit. So body, mind, heart, soul. Uh, body, how do, what do I feel? And, you know, in the big picture, you know, we all have visions, mission, strategy, execution. Certainly at an organizational level, I, what's our vision statement here? Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> we used to have it on our card, didn't we? Or that was the mission statement, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, uh, individuals can too. You can have your own, you know, and if you, it's not formal. We all have a vision of where we want to go and what we want to do, but we get stuck, on, stuck in execution sometimes. Um, so the skill is doing, positive is pleasure, negative is pain. And these strategies I think are good, and I, so I'd recommend all of these um, for, uh, you know, if you're in that emotional exhaustion area. What do I think? It's so knowing uh, positive is happiness, negative is anxiety. Uh, yeah, and so anxiety is another one is that is very common now. I think everybody's got a lot of anxiety. Um, but again, um, these are some of the mitigations for that. And then heart, what do I desire? So it's understanding, joy, sadness. And some of the resilience activities, gratitude, that's a good one too. I, I didn't go into that one, but kindness and compassion, I'll go into that a little bit. And then soul work is, uh, you know, why am I here? What am I doing this for? Uh, skill is wisdom, ecstasy is despair. So prayer, wonder, and awe. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So, again, I just wanted to see how you fit into the big picture because, again, mind-body is great. I've done every single one of these, not every day, but over time I've tried them all. And they're good. They, they are good for uh, emotional exhaustion, I think. And um, perhaps uh, depersonalization, but the depersonalization is really where you got to keep an eye open for. So let's talk a little bit about compassion. And you've heard of compassion fatigue, and I think that's misnamed also. I think it's a, a empathy fatigue. And here's why. So empathy is I feel your suffering, and compassion is I want to relieve your suffering. And there's a big difference there. So in contrast to empathy, compassion doesn't mean you're sharing in the suffering of a patient. It's a motivation to improve their well-being. It's feeling for, not uh, feeling with the other. And um, decreases, it decreases uh, the personal... Oh, so if you, if you practice compassion, it decreases depersonalization and, and, and it gives you pro-social or motivation. <clears throat> and um, so this kind of compares and contrasts with that. So empathy fatigue, I think if you're feeling the pain of others, it just wears you down. It has a negative impact, whereas uh, compassion doesn't. Well, how do we know that? Can you find compassion in the brain? And so these are really interesting studies. I don't understand them really well, but <laughs> they're MRIs. You, you train somebody in uh, compassion, train them in empathy, and then see what lights up in the brain. And they're very distinct areas. Empathy training results in increased negative affect and uh, decreasing helping behaviors. Compassion training reverses these effects, augments resilience, which I think is encouraging. It, 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 uh, maybe there is some plasticity involved and opens many benefits, which can be particularly beneficial for persons working in helping professions. Now, I used to think that you could not change your leopard spots, meaning you're either born with it or you're not. Now I'm not so sure. I, I don't know, but this would indicate that there's some potential. If, if it doesn't come naturally for you, it's possible. In fact, uh, a year or two, a billionaire up in South Dakota donated a, $100 million to US, UCSD to develop the um, <clears throat> Institute for Empathy and Compassion. And again, the idea is that um, if you uh, if we understand how it functions cognitively, we can figure out how to enhance it. And so, of course, we all start off here because we want to help people, um, but um, that often gets crushed. So I, I don't have the answer. I'm just saying I think there's some hope there that this is something that if you don't have it naturally, it can be trained. But if it comes hard for you, try kindness. And I think there is 99 opportunities a shift that you could do that. And um, it took me a while to figure that out because you, a lot of times I'm kind of grumpy. Uh, but 
you know, there's every, now the nasty consultant, now I haven't figured that one out, we're not Mother Teresa yet, but, <laughs> but I think all the other ones, we can do a kind word, now why would you do that? Well, they're good for you too, so you hear about self-care, I you need to, I'm going to go to the spa today and take care of myself, but acts of, random acts of kindness are also good for you, and this, the, you know, these are the physiologic benefits of being kind, but not only being kind, but studies that just say, I want you to observe kindness uh, for this period of time. And this day, you know, you can be kind to your family or strong ties or people you know or yourself or observe it and then compare it to control group. And um, it increased the individual's happiness and everybody except the control group. So again, I think that's something you might have to work at a little bit, but that it's an area that if you practice that, that um, it may have some benefits for yourself. So now uh, that was under the heart category. Now we're moving over to the soul category and talk about awe. So awe is an interesting area. Uh, lots of studies in the last 10 years on awe and its uh, impact and benefit. So it has two components to it. One's this experience of amazement, reverence, something awesome and usually has a, a component of fear involved with it. Um, so some awful, um, so this one, was, you know, saying the edge of the cliff's a good one, because that's kind of scary. That's, uh, and anatomically, I learned what the cream master muscle was when I would stand <laughs> on the edge of the cliff here. <laughs> like, whoa, I didn't know how, how'd that work, but anyway, uh, <laughs> if you ever experience awe, then uh, there's two components to that experience. One is vastness. So you're experiencing something larger. Phys it doesn't have to be physical either. It can be metaphorical or conceptual. Something vast. and then, um, But it puts you in perspective of where you fit in on the big picture. And then because of that, then you have to have some accommodation. So you need to modify your current mental, uh, mental structures and opens mind new ways of thinking. So that's not all done at a conscious level. It just happens. So can you find awe in the brain? And sure enough, you can. It increases. Uh, and these are difficult studies because how do you induce awe uh, experimentally? And there are different ways they've done that. Um, but when they do that, um, and that's another area is figuring out how to induce awe in, in these kind of studies. Um, it decreased the activity of the default uh, mode network. I didn't know what that was other than... Um, uh, when I saw that it's similar to ketamine, have you ever used a facilitative dose of ketamine on a patient for pain, and they come out and say, what was that? I feel wonderful. <laughs> Has that ever happened to anybody? I, mean, I had the kids see the purple roller coasters, but when you use that little dose, it's like they feel really good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it reduces awareness of self as that part of the brain, and, and all experiences act... Uh, activate, uh, uh, decrease activation in that area, so there's a physiologic response there. Now we're in trouble. Oh, I don't know what this was. So um, one of the deals they do in, um, experimentally is they'll take a, like a picture and go out from Earth, and then as they go out, and I, I knew that I shouldn't do a video on these lectures because <laughs> sometimes the buttons don't always work. And they found that that even works better than if you start far out and move in. But anyway, this is a little non-video demonstration. Of course, there's Earth. And this was an iconic picture the, called the Blue Dot. And that was 1990 when the uh, Voyager was leaving the solar system. And right before it turned its cameras off, it turned around to take a picture of Earth. And it caught it in this sun race, that little speck of dirt there. Everybody ever knew, everybody that's ever lived, everybody that's going to live on that little speck of dirt there. You got that right. So you're right. Yeah, the blue dot. Yeah, Google it. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't like Carl Sagan so much, but I thought his comments on that were pretty good. Of course, we're just part of a solar system. And, uh, of course, we're just solar system, part of the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy which is part of a big galactic group. And that big galactic group's part of a supercluster. And that supercluster is just one of many superclusters. And in the observable universe that, you know, so 
I didn't realize this. That there's more galaxies than there are grains of sand on Earth. So and you think about that kind of, that, well, that's pretty vast. That's, you know, how do I accommodate to that? You know, when I'm just looking at what's in front of me here. Do we have any amateur um, uh, astrologers here? Anybody own a telescope? No? A few people do. So if you could just focus on this little spot right here, you'd see 2,000 galaxies if you, if you had a deep enough telescope. Anyway, that's a, not a great demonstration, but that's what you mean by vastness. Did anybody see the solar eclipse? Were you in totality? Were you in totality? Mm -hmm. uh, was that awesome or not? It was unexpected. I'm growing up, I got those glasses because we were impartial, and you'd look up and say, oh, yeah, half the sun is blocked off. But if you're in totality, uh, yeah, it went dark. That, that was amazing. By the way, if you missed it, there's going to be another one in 2024. It's going to be down there by Cape Girardeau. Get your hotel reservations now because, <laughs> like, we, I decided two weeks before, we were, I only had to drive to Kearney, which is about two hours from Omaha, and there was nothing, no hotels anywhere to be found. So I found an old friend. Uh, uh, well, you were, Clint Jones, he lived in Kearney, so I stayed with him. But anyway, um, Ed and I went to college together, and so... Yeah, if you get a chance, go go see that. You don't have to wait for something two or three times a year. This is something, I don't do it every year, but I try to do it as often as I can. Is um, the, Now, if you see a sand, curl in a, cor a sand crane in a cornfield, it's not that awesome. But when they come in at nighttime to roost or when they take off, has anybody seen that before? Was, was it awesome? Yeah. That's unbelievable. Uh, how, where were you, where'd you go? Okay. Would they come in to roost at nighttime? Yeah. What about you? I was in Kearney. Are you from Nebraska? I went to med school at Creighton. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to describe it other than you, that the, the sound it makes and everything. It's just unbelievable. But there's also on everyday life. So you don't have to wait once a year for this to happen. This was a couple years ago up in north, north, north of Omaha, this double twister here. Talk about fear. That'd be kind of scary. So this study looked at um, gathering reports of all over two weeks. And uh, the subjects uh, that were in that study, when they looked for it, found it about every third day. And the ones that did report that he had seen it had reported greater uh, well-being than those who did not. So again, I think it's part of self-care. And it's not something you have to do intentionally other than be aware of it. Now, you can do it intentionally, but you probably see it every day. So benefits of awe uh, makes you feel smaller, more humble, um, which I think is a, you know, um, when I think of Dr. McNabney, I think of a humble person, you know, and so I think that's a good trait. Um, can make you feel like you have more time. That's good, too. You kind of get in that zone. Um, and then this is the depersonalization, I think, effects in, in terms of mitigating that. It makes you feel more generous, cooperative, more connected with other people. So if, our, if all is hard, try wonder. And again, the difference is the kind of um, that vastness uh, that requires accommodation or that wonder plus fear is, is kind of hard to reproduce. But there's wonder everywhere, whether it's music, art, food, people, sporting feats, green space. I just chose one green space study that looked at um, 103 uh, observational and 40 interventional studies on green space. So in other words, going out in nature. Um, had all these beneficial effects to it and report of self-well-being. So again, this is self-care if you um, put yourself in that position. And some of the studies, even there is a dose response. So, you know, how much time you spend. It doesn't take that much time. And again, um, just something to consider. So in summary, um, Beware of the studies. Again, don't feel too down on them uh, or down on your specialty or yourself, you know, looking at how much burnout there is. Report it in the studies. Um, but having said that, it's a wicked problem, and, um, and it's a spectrum, and we're all on that spectrum. And just keep that in mind. And you can mitigate it externally the best you can. Of course, sometimes you don't have a lot of control in your workplace and what's going on there, but certainly your home environment, uh, 
I can manage that. Maybe. Although I will say, some there was a period in my life when I liked going to work because I could finally relax. So maybe, <laughs> if you have a fan, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, this is crazy. I'm going to work, and it's like, ah, <laughs> bring it on. Uh, emotional uh, exhaustion is the gateway. So when you're when you're exhausted, you know certainly work on mind body stuff. They're they're helpful. And when you get to um, cynicism and beyond, uh, you got to go a little deeper. And if it, and if it goes even beyond that, you need professional help. Don't be afraid to ask for it. Um, and that's it. It's the end of my talk. So we went a lot of different places there. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Adam. Uh, no, that was a great talk and obviously uh, super important and, and relevant for uh, practicing physicians. So thanks for uh, educating us. You, you focused a lot on the individual and, and you know things that you can do as an individual. How much responsibility do you think falls on you know, the health systems and the hospital systems to do things to help help us manage wellness and do do those things like, you know, EMR issues and things like that. Uh, what, where do you think their responsibility lies? Yeah, I think they play a big role. Um, again, the strategy, of course, besides increasing resilience opportunities to decrease stress or distress at work or home, so I think they play a big role in that. Uh, I, I'm a little cautious because it's a big industry now for um, organizations to bring in the burnout <coughs> company to help with burnout in their employees and whatnot. And, I, and I'm a little bit um, cynical about some of that work. But I think in, the, in, in some of the strategies I've seen don't seem to really hit the mark that, that they're needed, but I think the organization plays a huge role. I don't know, Mark, I mean, I'm sure it's been addressed, or Matt. Yeah, I, I actually was gonna ask that same question, and uh, but before I get into that, I wanna say that cynicism, uh, realism is frequently mistaken for cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> I just What's say, your point, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, nice, nice try. You yeah. said you were cynical about those things, but really you're realistic about those things, <laughs> in my opinion. But anyway, uh, to your question, so yeah, I think there, well, when I have talked with some individuals about wellness, they are they basically say, don't tell me about resilience, damn it, I'm resilient enough, I want you to fix the, and then they will name something, the EMR, my terrible clinic, uh, operational issues, the fact that we don't have enough doctors, nurses, techs, whatever. And, uh, but those are wicked problems too, in all honesty. Some of the problems, though, could be addressed at the unit level, and I don't mean that that provider themselves can just fix it, but if they get with the people in their unit, the other providers, nurses, techs, the administration of that unit, often, not always, but often they can make changes that might actually help the operations, the things that are bugging them the most. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, don't anybody shoot me. Even with the EHR, there are resources at most facilities that have people who are actually expert in it, who may be able to help some if you sit down with them and let them go over. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely things about the operations of a healthcare system that are painful for all. But but just saying, oh my God, I hate the EMR, mm -hmm. isn't going to fix it. <laughs> So uh, words are important, and I agree with you on cynicism versus realism because um, I think in the in some ways cynicism is a good coping strategy with the right group of people. In other words, black humor in the uh, lunchroom or the break room with your peers, although it's trickier these days on what kind of black humor that is. But you know, to be cynical is kind of a stress relief within that group. But if it's where you hate your patients, I think that's where it crosses the line. Um, so I think you're right. The realism or the black humor to a certain point um, is, a, is a bit of a stress reliever. But uh, when you start hating your patients, that kind of cynicism, that's a warning flag. And I hear you about the chair of the department should fix the problem. <laughs> I, I agree with that. <laughs> and, uh, I feel that way. Thank you. <laughs> I think the um, they're uh, they're um, 
Yeah, it's a tough dynamic. I know what you're talking about in terms of, you know, what's expected at this higher level. What can they really affect and what is a, the individual's responsibility? And I, I'm more cynical on the resilience <coughs> classes and things like that so much. I, I think you can educate yourself on that. But I think there there is a responsibility of, to do whatever they can to help. And, you know, when 200 people show up with COVID, there's not a whole lot. You're in you're in crisis mode, um, but um, I think having an ear, or at least people feel like they're being heard, is is a good step also. And um, but they're they're difficult. Yes. Um, could you flip to your uh, the prior slide? So there have been studies of gender uh, in burnout. Uh, let's see the last slide that summarizes. Oh uh -huh. yeah, that one. Yeah. There uh, there have been studies of gender in burnout that say it's the same between men and women, although women have more emotional exhaustion and men uh, more depersonalization. <laughs> what a, and so the strategies would be different there. But have you come across any studies that looked at uh, gender and specialty in terms of whether there's any difference uh, depending on what your career choice is? I'm trying to think. I looked at a lot. I don't remember any specifically separating that out. I, did. Yeah. I asked because I'm a pediatrician, right? I'm a pediatric ID doc. And when you look at uh, pediatricians, we're a mainly female specialty. Um, and uh, I don't know if that influences uh, burnout in our, in our field versus in other specialties where maybe it's more... You know, I've seen more commentaries on that than actual studies and the idea, of course, the child care issues, uh, for exactly. one thing. I mean, there's more exactly. than that, but the, but certainly that usually falls on the, the female, um, you know, if you're working full time and, you know, whether part, you know, so I've seen commentary on that, but I haven't seen studies breaking that out. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but, um, but I think there is a difference. There is a difference. I was just going to say that I think that one of the things that helps when you're in your medical school and residency is to be able to vocalize your concerns, stresses, frustrations, and things like that. I know that that's how some of us get through. Chris and I were in training together, and, and I'm saying this because I think even when you leave your training, you're going to need that person to bounce things off of. We, would, we, would, we were both working um, in suburban hospitals, and we would get together together. And basically, we clear the whole restaurant because we sit there for four hours. We were sharing with each other, still learning. We, should, we said we should have been getting CME hours. Yeah. <laughs> but, but allowing yourself to be vulnerable with someone that you trust in your training program, whether it's a nurse, a paramedic, a coworker, a faculty member, allowing yourself to say, I need to share this with you because this is how I process um, it's a wonderful thing, and developing those relationships and continuing those friendships and relationships, that, that's kind of, I think, how you build that um, resilience, is your relationships that you form and build. But you sometimes have to be active in forming them and reaching them. Um, so that's the other thing I think is, is that the whole issue of burnout and all of that is you may not be able to prevent it. You may be able to go slow it or work with it if you have that kind of partner in crime. So uh, that's what I just encourage you to find that person now and, and, and have that kind of anchor because that's that's what's going to get you through. Is what, We were in a class of six. Did you have six? Uh -huh. So what's how many are in the program now? Eleven. 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 Yeah, that's still a very intimate group. Everybody knows everybody. So if you see somebody floundering... It's okay to ask them if they need help. That's a good point, Dr. Beth. I call it misery loves miserable company. <laughs> <laughs> no, isolation, it's interesting because, um, you know, it, part of it is, your, is, is a strategy, meaning that um, your resources are being depleted. I need to isolate myself to preserve those resources. But you're right, that friend that you can be cynical with is... Huge. Just say, am I okay? Is my thing yeah. right? Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's the kind of the pro-socialization. And um, yeah, no, isolation is an important one to watch for. Um, 
Dr. Bratton. Yeah. You know, I, I really enjoyed your talk, too. I particularly like talking about compassion and kindness because I think those are actually really easy things to do. And I'm sure others may disagree with me, particularly the kindness part. <laughs> like, why can't we just be nice to each other? Yeah. And, and you know, I haven't um, solved the problem of uh, obnoxious consultants other than mostly the residents deal with those. So I, <laughs> so I, guess, I guess that's good. But, but, you know, being kind to people, that goes so far. And it not only makes them feel better, it makes you feel better, too. So. You know, it took me a long time to figure that out, too. I mean, you'd be... Like, hey, how's it going? How's it going? But um, to intentionally, um, you know, compliment the nurse or the housekeeper or the medical student, just give them the time. You know, it, 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 in some ways it has to be intentional, at least at first. But, um, and, and when people are kind to me, it's like, that feels pretty good. But also the, the studies that show that when you're kind to somebody else, it's good for you also. So I say uh, hi to every EBS worker that I walk by. Yeah. Every tech. Yeah. What do you do with nasty consultants? Um, <laughs> I ask them how they're doing. I'm like, are yeah. you okay? No, you can disarm yeah. them. You're right. Because I, I don't do that every time. So the ones I know better, when they come down, I say, are you okay? Yeah, you're, but, you but can I, disarm them pretty quickly. I usually say, I'm the attending physician. And then the nastiness, <laughs> and then the nastiness goes down. Right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Excellent talk, I agree. Uh, comment and a question. The comment is um, in regards to here at Truman, obviously, well, University Health, I feel like we're very special and protected because our CMOs are emergency medicine. So uh, thanks to Dr. Steele and the other leaders, Dr. McNamney, who have set that up for us. So going into my question, do you find a difference between the academic centers and the community shops, or is it hard to delve into with the studies, looking at the difference between working and the two. Yeah, I'm trying to think on the studies that um, usually um, on burnout prevalence, it's it doesn't distinguish between the two. Um, some of the smaller studies will say, you know, at this academic center, but most of them um, spread that out, uh, you know, to diffusely, and they'll say this many were at academic centers, this many were at private institutions. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I, I think there's an interesting stressor to the academics with promotion, research, subspecialties, residents, all the extraneous to do's. But then again, I feel that protection of our close-knit group and the... Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, you know, when I was recruiting, I tell people, here's the good news is you're going to work a little bit less shifts, so because that's a stressor. The bad news is you're going to work more hours yeah. <laughs> because these are the expectations. But you have a little bit more control over that, and um, so yeah, that and 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 I find that after five years, either people like make peace with that or they leave in terms of the academic side. But Dr. Sullivan, you are in private practice. I, maybe you could address that better. I I've worked at several places, but. Usually they have an academic affiliation. Well, I mean, the, some of the stress or the things that can lead to burnout are the same, um, whether you're academic or community. But what one of the things that on the community side is there's less of that kind of discussion about interesting cases or, you know, hey, can you look at this rash or whatever. Because when, when I was working in the community, I was by myself. And so there was... It was kind of a built-in isolation. I wanted to get the heck out of there when I was done with my shift, and the person that came on wanted to, you know, me be gone, and so they could do their stuff. And, and there wasn't a lot of communication, and so that sometimes led to some stress because you didn't feel that kind of teamwork, kind of skill as much. So. Yeah, I, I know as a resident or student when I work or as a student rotate in a community. Is, the guys were practicing their golf swing quite a bit. Patients, <laughs> or kind of the Wall Street Journal was out. They were like studying the Wall Street Journal. But. Yeah, nice. <laughs> it, it all depends on your volume, right? And yeah. Hey, Christine, no. you mentioned the burnout survey that we're using here. Yeah, I, I uh, and, and Dr. Grattan probably obviously like, please like why not talk about it. Um, it's uh, we we at UMKC um, have our residents and fellows, uh, faculty uh, and uh, 
medical students and graduate students um, had the opportunity to do the well-being index by Mayo Clinic that's kind of looking uh, for physicians. It's a nine question uh, answer uh, or question survey uh, to take a look. And it's, it more points towards levels of high distress. Uh, and then that high distress then uh, equates to increased risk for uh, burnout, for medical error, leaving the specialty, that kind of thing. And so uh, it, we're trying to do it every six months and then kind of tracking departments, gender, PG year, different things uh, over time. So, so as an example, a couple of things that we have found so far is that our younger physicians, regardless of specialty, that, that are faculty, they're a little bit more stressed uh, than, than uh, the more seasoned uh, physicians. And maybe that's because they're working more clinically. Don't, don't know. Uh, then uh, our PG year four and plus uh, residents and fellows, they're more stressed than the junior, uh, which is kind of interesting for you to think maybe first year residents would be the most stressed out or something that, uh, you know, but as you get older, I don't know if it's more responsibility or more outside stressors, but those are more stressed. We have seen some uh, differences between specialties. Family medicine, at least here, seems to be one of the higher stressed um, specialties. So we are seeing some changes on that. I, I don't know if you saw, there's a couple of studies because it's a validated instrument. I was just wondering if yeah, uh, the, so the first year versus uh, third or fourth year that in the resident study that they found the same thing. Yeah. I think the um, you know, part of it is um, they're a little bit more protected in terms of their work work hours, and then part of it is uh, I think just the because um, I, I remember going into my back then your first year was all internships you didn't do any ER and then you go in the ER that kind of bump the stress up and like, oh, do I get a strep test or not? And you get the <laughs> <laughs> and later it's like a little more. <laughs> um, but what do you guys do with the results? I mean, it's good to track it. I, I, I think that's a great thing. And I think there's a little bit of a Hawthorne effect. You know, if you're being looked at, it's like, well, somebody kind of cares. Yeah, so that's kind of the next step. So like as an example for the GME programs, they get that data, each specific resident program and then they're supposed to go to their um, residents and then find out what's kind of going on see if there's again any sort of mitigation strategies and everything they have to report that and it's reviewed um, by the graduate medical education council every year and, and stuff like that what we haven't done a lot of is other than at Truman now uh, Dr. Grattan and Dr. Subramanian are going to academic chairs and presenting that data. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. So. Uh, sure, Colin, maybe uh, as the chair of the wellness committee, maybe you would rather. Oh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, well, so. yeah. It's basically what she said. So we, uh, there's an engagement survey at Truman, which is not directly wellness, and then there's the well-being index. And so Dr. Subramanian and I have uh, picked the, the biggest five uh, departments and have met with all of their chairs and have invited ourselves to their department meetings to go over the results of both engagement survey and well-being index. And uh, a couple of the departments who will go and name, let's just say, have not uh, had very good well-being or engagement. And uh, so when we get with faculty, we will talk with them about it. And we're not coming in as saviors to fix things, but we are going to point out that the, the comments would make you think that many of their problems that they are complaining about are operational issues that are unique to that department that, like, they have to fix, and so they should start working on it. No, so, and and I, yeah. I might say, since I see some residents actually looking at me, uh, it, we don't have the resident data for that. That's all staff position data. Uh, we will be getting access to the resident data, too, and hope to do the same sort of thing with the uh, the GME program, as Dr. You know, Solomon said. No, I think that's a good start. It, you know, it, again, my problem isn't the surveying; it's saying that you're burned out. It, now, hopefully, it'll pick somebody in distress, and they're, you know, with the stage whatever at the bottom there that there are people in distress that needs a response like that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, so it's anonymous, yeah. so so the organization can't respond to it. Um, 
but an individual gets their report and they can see themselves over time. They can take it up to every month to kind of track what they're doing. And then there is on that um, website, there's links to different things. There's like resilience and this and that. So there's different resources for, you know, because it shows you how you're doing compared to the mean in your specialty across the country and everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you can't. I, I can't tell you that a lot of people have access the resources that are there, which are pretty good. A lot of them are videos and that. Kind you know what I've seen in our GME and medical school in the last couple of years is really letting people know if you're in trouble, we could please come forward because you know though, that's the group that really needs a lot of help right now. And, and I, I UFKC has a lot of signage everywhere. It's okay yeah. not to be okay. And, right, know. right, right, right. So that's that. I think that's improved quite a bit. So. Well, I think I've kept you long. It, was it as good as a cadaver lamb? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's standing.